Coming up on The Cut, Nancy Pelosi's husband is attacked. The latest on the attacker's motive. North Korea launches missiles into the sea. What this means for South Korea and the U.S. And Rihanna's latest single, how it connects to the release of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. The Cut starts now. Hello and welcome to The Cut Network. I'm Donovan Growney. And I'm Emily Foxmillian. Kidnapping, that is what the man who attacked Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's home could be facing on f could be facing. On Friday, authorities say a man broke into Nancy Pelosi's California home looking for her. 42-year-old David DePere allegedly broke in around 2.30 in the morning, smashing through the windows. You can see it in this aerial video here. DePere assaulted Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, with a hammer to the head. Pelosi was taken to the ICU and required surgery. According to local police, DePere had zip ties and duct tape on the scene. The Speaker of the House was in Washington at the time and was unharmed. Tragedy struck during a Halloween celebration in South Korea's capital city, Seoul. At least 150 people are dead and several more are in critical condition after a stampede occurred inside a tight alleyway. Many of the partygoers were trapped for over an hour before they were able to be rescued. The tragedy comes just as the city was having their first Halloween celebration in three years due to COVID. The turnout for the celebrations was extremely large and the relief of COVID restrictions finally being lifted in the country could have drawn out more people than usual to the area. The stampede is reminiscent of the Travis Scott Astroworld concert in Houston, where eight people died after a crowd surge. South Korean officials are currently working to find out what exactly caused the slow-moving stampede to be so lethal. A popular tourist attraction in India is being blamed for the death of at least 134 people. On Sunday, a suspension bridge collapsed in Gurat, which is, the, which is a state in the western part of India. Over 30 of the victims were young children. Authorities say the suspension bridge collapsed after a cable on one end of the bridge snapped. The 230-meter-long bridge was built in the 19th century but had just undergone repairs. It is estimated about 200 people were on the bridge when it collapsed. Breaking news, North Korea fired three missiles towards the sea. In response, South Korea issued an air raid alert on its eastern island. Since one of the missiles landed just 16 miles south of the Korea's eastern sea border, NBC reports that the missile launchers occurred after North Korea had issued a threat to use nuclear weapons and to make the U.S. and South Korea pay the most horrible price in history. Experts say that North Korea is trying to test Washington over joint military exercises they have had with South Korea. The White House denies that they are trying to provoke North Korea. With elections right around the corner, Arizona election officials could have the opportunity to hand count early ballots that come in. The call for hand counting votes comes from claims of voter fraud from the 2020 election, and the discussion of whether or not to use this method is mostly split between the parties. Larissa is here to give us some more information about what this could mean for Arizona. Thanks, Donovan and Emily. Arizona election officials have been given permission to hand count early ballots and votes cast on Election Day in Colchise County. The new Arizona Attorney General, Republican Mark Bronovich, issued the opinion in the wake of election fraud claims surrounding the 2020 election. This plan would require hundreds of volunteers to count the ballots, something opposing Democrats feel is not practical nor feasible. If this measure were approved, the hand count would take place, as well as a machine count that would be used for legal results. The current Secretary of State and gubernatorial candidate Katie Hobbs, who is the state's top election official, has issued a warning that hand-counting early ballots is not legal. Early voting ballots make up to 80 percent of Arizona's votes. Penal County officials have also been discussing implementing a hand count. These controversial measures are being met with pushback from Democratic leaders. For The Cut, I'm Larissa May. Thank you, Larissa. We will keep you updated as more information is released. The Supreme Court of the United States met on Monday to hear arguments regarding the future of affirmative action in college admissions. Five different lawyers spoke in front of the justices, with three in support of the continuation of affirmative action and two against. Conservatives have long been vocal about their disagreement with affirmative action, and the main point echoed by Justice Amy Coney Barrett was that affirmative action is not a permanent solution to a lack of diversity. Lawyers from the opposing side argued that in order for workplaces and field of employment to be diverse, it needs to start in the classroom. 
With a 6-3 conservative majority in the Supreme Court, it is looking as though affirmative action may be coming to an end soon. As the November election nears, reporter Tyler Abrams is here to talk about what exactly will be on the ballot this year. Thanks, guys. Here in Arizona, the citizens have the privilege to create their own initiatives to be voted on this midterm. In any vote, it's important to be f informed on the content and purpose of these propositions so that you can remain an active voter for your state. There are 10 propositions on the ballot this year, so without further delay, here are six of the important ones. Proposition 130 will make it easier for veterans and widows to receive property tax exemptions on things like their homes or furnishings. Proposition 131 will allow the creation of a lieutenant governor position that will be filled by the governor's running mate on an electoral ticket. This new initiative would go into effect the following gubernatorial election and will ensure a solid line of succession. In Arizona, currently, if the governor's office were to suddenly be vacated, the secretary of state would then become the next governor. Proposition 130 would ensure consistency in the office. Proposition 209 concerns debt and interest rates. This prop would lower the maximum interest rates on medical debt from 10% to 3%, protecting lower income families from debt collection. This prop would also increase the value of exempt properties like furniture and homes. Proposition 308 applies to all Arizona residents, but would primarily benefit DREAMers or Arizona residents who were brought to the U.S. illegally as children. This proposition would allow all Arizona residents, regardless of immigration status, to receive in-state tuition as long as they have attended an Arizona high school for at least two years. Proposition 310 would establish a fire district safety fund, which would create a one-tenth of a cent sales tax that would allow the state to fund financially lacking fire districts. This prop, would apply to the only, this prop would not apply to the cities, so Phoenix residents would remain unaffected. Now on to the big ones. Proposition 309 changes voter identification laws for mail-in ballots. Typically, you only need a signature, but if passed, this prop would require mail-in voters to provide a date of birth and voter ID before mailing in their vote. It would also provide more access to voter IDs for citizens that do not currently have one. And lastly, Proposition 211, also known as the Voters' Right to Know Act, would increase the transparency of election campaign donations. This proposal is in response to the 2011 Federal Election Commission v. Citizens United Supreme Court decision, which allowed corporations to donate election campaigns without limits and without voters knowing where the money came from. This problem would allow citizens to know that information. Back to you at the desk. Thank you, Tyler. It is important to stay informed about all of the propositions so that you are ready to fill out your ballots for the upcoming elections. The largest Latin American country will soon be seeing a power shift with a political turn 180 degrees in nature. Right-leaning President Jair Bolsonaro has lost to left-leaning politician Luis Inacio Lula da Silva to become the next president of Brazil. This is a video of da Silva meeting with Argentina's president. Da Silva is 77 years old and governed Brazil from 2003 to 2010, but then spent more recent years in jail over corruption charges. Bolsonaro has not conceded the election as of Wednesday, and his supporters are protesting. According to Brazil's Federal Highway Police, there have been 321 blockades of the roads in support of Bolsonaro. Da Silva will officially take office on January 1st. Over the past few days, the Philippines has been subjected to the tropical storm Nalgi. Floods and landslides were just some of the outcomes of the storm, and Alec is here to give us some more information. Thanks, Emily. Last week, tropical storm Nalgi made landfall in the Philippines, causing mass flooding and landslides. The majority of deaths reported are coming in from Maguindanao Providence in a Muslim autonomous region. The government's main disaster response agency have stated that there were at least 98 storm deaths and seven other fatalities were later reported by three provincial governors. At least 69 people were injured and 63 people remain missing. A large contingent of rescue workers, bulldozers, and sniffer dogs are currently working in southern Kyrsong village, where as many as 80 to 100 people have feared to have been buried by boulder-laden mudslide or swept away by flash floods that started overnight Thursday. Entire families are thought to be buried together, said Nagiba Sinalibo, the interior minister for the Bank Samaro Autonomous Region. The official tally of missing people is thought to be an understatement of the actual amount since families buried together have left no one to tell official authorities of their fate. The catastrophe at Kirsong Village has been particularly tragic because the village runs disaster preparedness drills every year in case of tsunamis. But this time the trouble came not from extreme rising levels of water but from the mountain behind them and the mud and land
land that came sliding down on where the villagers had run for cover. About 1.9 million people were hit by the storm, and at least 4,100 houses and 40,180 acres of rice and other crops were damaged by floodwaters at the time when the country was bracing for a looming food crisis because of the current global supply disruptions. For The Cut, I'm Alex Sagaris Woods. Thank you. We send our thoughts and prayers to all of those affected by the storm. The Arizona Robotics League tournament took place over the weekend. Cut reporter Pedro Rojas is here with what went down during this year's action. Roughly three miles northwest of ASU's West Campus is Cactus High School, home to the Cobra Commanders and this year's Arizona Robotics League tournament. Their fifth and final qualifier matches were played this past weekend, and the championship will be played in mid-November. Eight teams from around the state traveled to Glendale to participate. And while the tournament is off-season, it provides practice for newcomers as well as a refresher for returning members. The typical structure of a match goes as follows. The 15-second autonomous period begins the match, and during this period, the robot relies solely on its programming, and the only limit to your robot is time. Once the autonomous period is over, the drivers take control of the robots. Matches get intense during the section, and many robots end up damaged heavily due to flips or falls. The objective during the section in particular is to score as many points as possible. Either that or prevent your opposing teams from scoring as often as possible. How quickly teams gain points depends on how short their cycle times are. Essentially, how long it takes a robot to pick up cargo between shots. Finally, the 30-second endgame begins. During endgame, specific tasks open up that award very high points. This last season, First Forward allowed teams to climb a set of rungs to the left of their stations. Higher robots and multiple robots increase a team's chances of receiving a ranking point, which allows teams to move up in the leaderboards. After qualification matches, alliance selection is underway. The eight top-ranked teams choose two other teams and a backup to compete alongside during the final matches. Not every team is selected during the season. After selection, teams hurry to strategize and fix their robots in time for the semifinals. Semifinals are where the intensity begins to increase. Alliances play two matches against each other until two alliances remain for the finals. As the most awaited and exciting part of the competition, two final matches are played, with a tiebreaker being played in case of a tie between alliances. First Energize, presented by Qualcomm. The 2023 season First Energize begins in January, and teams get roughly six weeks to build and completely control their robot. Stay tuned for more updates. For The Cut, I'm Pedro Rojo. Over to you at the desk. That was The Cut's Pedro Rojas. Russia announced their withdrawal from participating in the United Nations brokered grain export deal with Ukraine on Saturday. Drones attacked the Crimean city of Savastopol, and Moscow blames Kyiv for the attacks. Moscow claims that British Navy specialists had helped coordinate the terrorist attack. London bluntly rejected Moscow's claim. The Turkey and unbrokered deal to unlock grain exports signed between Russia and Ukraine in July is critical to easing the global food crisis caused by the conflict. The agreement has already allowed more than 9 million tons of Ukrainian grain to be exported and was due to be renewed on November 19th. According to Andrei Rujenko, Russia's deputy foreign minister, any discussion about the Ukraine grain agreement would be possible only after the UN Security Council holds a meeting on the attack on the Black Sea ships. Elon Musk recently officially obtained Twitter. A document filed with financial regulators Monday showed Twitter's board had been dismissed, another step leaving the company in Musk's sole control. Later Monday, a financial filing officially revealed that Musk is CEO of the company. The team was deciding on what is expected to be of the first round of layoffs, which will target roughly a quarter of the staff, totaling more than 7,000, according to one person familiar with the matter. Layoffs will touch almost all departments and are expected to specifically impact sales, product, engineering, legal, and trust and safety in the coming days, the person said. After engineers, some of, the Twitter, some of Twitter's highest paid employees work in sales, where several earn more than $300,000, according to documents viewed by The Post. These past couple of weeks have been filled with new music announcements, including singer Rihanna's newest song, Lift Me Up. The song was produced for the film Black Panther Wakanda Forever and is already at the top of the Billboard's hot trending songs list. 
The song will likely not be leaving the charts anytime soon, and Charlie Vicario has more information on the release. Thank you, Emily. Last Friday, pop singer and songwriter Rihanna shared a new song, Lift Me Up. Here is a peek. Keep me close Safe and sound Her first as a lead artist in six years. It will feature on the soundtrack to Black Panther Wakanda Forever. The soundtrack will be available on November 4th ahead of the film's arrival. Rihanna wrote the song with the Marvel Movies director Ryan Coogler as a tribute to the late Chadwick Boseman, who passed away in August of 2020. There is no word yet on Rihanna's long-awaited ninth album, but anticipation has heated up since she announced in September that she would perform the Super Bowl 57 halftime show. Many are still wondering who will be joining Rihanna on the stage. The media guesses that Jay-Z will be her guest performer. The Super Bowl will take place February 12th in Glendale. For The Cut Network, I'm Charlie Vicario. Thank you, Charlie. I look forward to seeing Rihanna's Super Bowl performance next year. One of the more polarizing figures in the UK is coming out with a new book that is going to be released in 2023. Cut reporter Carly Poirier is here to give us an update. Thank you, Donovan. Random House Publishing announced last Thursday that Prince Harry's upcoming memoir will be released on January 10th, 2023. Along with the release date, the publishing house revealed the book's cover and title, Spare. Described as unflinchingly honest, the memoir will reflect upon the Duke of Sussex coming to age in the royal family after his mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, passing. The book will further examine his time as a captain in the British Army, his marriage to Meghan Markle, their departure from the royal firm, and his experiences as a father to their two young children. Many royal watchers and political critics have already begun to speculate on how damaging this tell-all could be for the British monarchy, as the firm is already on shaky grounds with the Commonwealth public after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. The newly appointed king and father to Prince Harry, Charles III, has once again begun to receive backlash for the mistreatment of his late ex-wife, Princess Diana, due to Netflix's The Crown's upcoming fifth season, showcasing their extramarital affairs, eventual divorce, and the media battle known as the War of the Whales. This British-led media battle and harassment, as well as mistreatment within the royal family that Princess Diana faced in the 90s, resurfaced in the mid-2010s, when Prince Harry and Meghan began dating. This mistreatment, recounted in their 2020 Oprah interview, escalated and eventually led to Prince Harry and Meghan deciding to step away from their brief time as working royals. For The Cut Network, I'm Carly Poyer. Thank you, Carly. It will be interesting to see how this memoir could affect the British monarchy. Trending this week, well, spooky season has wrapped up and Christmas decorations are starting to go up. But one thing is having a hard time moving on from Halloween, the sun. Take a look at these photos captured by NASA telescopes. Take a close look at the patterns in the sun. You will not be the only one saying that it looks a little bit like a jack-o'-lantern. These photos were captured on Halloween night. NASA has a word for it, a smiling sun. I don't know. Do you think that it looks like a jack-o'-lantern? Because I don't think I do. I mean, I'll be honest, Emily. From, from what I just saw, no. no not at all. Not at all. Not <laughs> it reminds at me of all. that dress where everyone thought it was like pink and yellow, but it was really black and blue. Exactly. But like, at least that was close. Maybe Here. some people see it. I don't know. Not us, though. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thank you for joining this week. Be sure to follow The Cut Network on social media. I'm Donovan Growney. And I'm Emily Foxmillion. We are off next week. We'll be, we will be back the next week. Have a great weekend, everyone.